I'm fascinated by commonly accepted outlines around social behavior. Things that we take for granted because they seem so self-evident. In the U.S., one of these things is the correctness, the near-righteousness of the Constitution. Now, this is a document that was written in 1787. didn't come into effect until 1789. And if you're from the States, like me, you probably learned something about it in school. But then you probably swiftly forgot it right after you took the test. So as a quick reminder, the first three articles of the Constitution are about the separation of power in the government into the legislative, executive, and judicial branches. The next three articles are all about federalism, the rights and responsibilities of state governments and their relationship to the overarching federal government. That's the one in Washington, D.C. Now, the seventh article, and there are only seven articles in the Constitution, is an outline of the procedure that would allow the Constitution to be ratified. That's it. That's, that's all seven articles of the Constitution. That is all there is to it. It is a relatively simple document as government founding documents, as nation founding documents go. It's so simple, in fact, that we have seen fit to amend it 27 times in the years since 1789. The first 10 of these changes was the Bill of Rights, and these offered up a variety of protections and individual liberties, which is great. And the next 17 different bills, different amendments to the Constitution, primarily expanded and expounded upon those 10 initial rights. Now, what's remarkable, or perhaps not, if you think about it, is that this document, this incredibly simple document, has been used to justify pretty much every argument that has ever been made, and it's been held up as evidence for opposing sides of the same feud more than once. The amendments are given equal weight, or ignored, or selectively ignored, depending on what's most convenient in the moment for the argument that you're making. And yet, despite all this, despite all this discussion and disagreement, this convenient ignoring of certain elements of the document in the amendments or the absolute recognition of them as concrete truth, the idea of constitutionality is still the bedrock to which we retreat in so many debates, particularly when those debates are themselves quite large and sprawling and blurry. I promise this episode isn't going to be a treatise on constitutional law, which is a thing, by the way, a serious field of study that is all about interpreting and implementing the letter of the U.S. Constitution, which I believe quite nicely makes my point about it being considered fundamental. This episode is, however, going to be about a topic that very frequently leads to declarations about the non-constitutionality of the opposing argument and the inherent constitutionality of one's own argument. This episode, I want to talk about free speech. You are listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. So the article I use as a starting point today is from the New Republic. It's entitled The Free Speech charade with free speech in quotes. And this article covers a debate that's going on right now on the internet and in the mainstream media and pretty much everywhere within schools as well, which is fitting because it is about free speech within schools primarily. And the angle that it takes is a very interesting one. I'll leave it to you to read that because it, it is just a starting point. I'm not going to go through it and each and every detail here. But it, it's a great starting point because a lot of the debate that's going on around free speech today is represented well in the debate around free speech 
on campuses, on college campuses around the United States. But before I get into that, I want to talk about the two extremes of this argument, the two extremes within the free speech argument. So we're not talking about completely capped speech, where you're not allowed to say anything and you're living within a totalitarian society. But what we're talking about is the two ends of the spectrum that we can still arguably call free speech, and that is absolute free speech and limited free speech. Absolute free speech is where you can say anything, anywhere, to anyone at any time. You can yell fire in a crowded theater, and that's totally legitimate because you have the freedom to do so. Now, the benefits of this are that you can say whatever you want, express yourself however you want. And the theory is that by allowing this level of freedom, although it's very often uncomfortable for a lot of different people, you also allow a great deal of growth and societal mutation. You allow people to express themselves, and as a result, you get a lot more frequent change because no ideas are being clamped down on and no one group is being oppressed for their ideas. Now, the downsides are myriad and diverse. You have absolute free speech and you enable different hate groups. You enable neo-Nazis and the KKK. You enable online trolls. You enable people to make threats to each other. You can threaten somebody else's life, and that falls firmly within freedom of speech if you have absolute free speech to say what you want to anyone. You enable very public declarations that are homophobic or racist or misogynistic. You enable slander. Uh, in an internet-enabled world in particular, this is really a major concern because the half-life of untruths has grown to an incredible length, an incredible duration. If I were to call someone a pedophile, whether or not they actually are is irrelevant, but if I call someone a pedophile, that's something that sticks around if it is presented in the right media, if it ends up on the internet. That is written in ink, and it's something that's very difficult to get rid of if you can, in fact, get rid of it at all. And that's something that then could haunt that person who, again, may or may not actually be a pedophile, but it's something that follows them around for the rest of their lives. And so you could argue that in some cases, okay, that's great. If they're actually a pedophile, that's saving somebody. But on the flip side, if there's no reason to believe they are, if it's somebody who has just been randomly slandered by me, then there's no recourse because it is my freedom of speech, my freedom of expression to say that. And now they have this label following them around for the rest of their life. This is the concern, by the way, that's led to the conflict between the European Union and Google. The European Union has demanded that Google allow people who live within the EU to have the right to be erased from the internet. And I mean, this argument shows a gross misunderstanding of the internet, <laughs> but it is something where Google could conceivably erase people from their search results. And to a lot of people, that is the internet. And so what they've had to do now is if you put in a request, then Google has to delete you, has to delete your name, has to delete images of you and all kinds of other things, all links to you and such from their search results. And so that is obviously a limit on free speech that we're seeing, but it is a very concrete example about who is concerned about these types of things and why they're concerned about it. And some of the repercussions of that, some of the repercussions of somebody perhaps who actually is a pedophile or somebody who is a criminal of some kind, being able to escape that past rather than having it follow them around. It's a double-edged sword for sure. Now, on the side of limited free speech, the major upside of that, as I mentioned, is that then you are able to avoid permanent slander in most cases. You're able to avoid being trolled if it's applied correctly, which it very often isn't, unfortunately. Uh, you're able to avoid having people rampantly, wantonly getting away with threatening other people or trying to incite other people to violence. You are able to crack down on all kinds of things that can disrupt society and that can disrupt somebody else's safety and can disrupt somebody else's life. But the downsides of this are also quite vast, and some would argue that they're 
just incredibly theoretical and the benefits of being able to crack down on those potential abuses are worthwhile. But we've seen a lot of this happen throughout modern history where limiting free speech gives a government or another body of control, another body of power, the ability to crack down on people who oppose them. It gives them the ability under the guise of limiting free speech of trying to prevent something that's harmful to go in and remove potential competition or to remove unpopular ideas or an unpopular group of people from public discourse. And the, like the most obvious example of this is the way that women, the way that minorities, the way that the LGBT community has been systematically oppressed throughout a great deal of modern history up until just recently and continuing today in a lot of different ways. It's improving, but it's still definitely an issue. That argument that people can make that we need to limit freedom of speech because it prevents abuse also allows the people who are in control to systematically abuse and remove and silence certain groups of people that are considered to be unpopular or unnecessary or that they simply don't want opposing them. You look around the world, you look at a lot of autocratic regimes, and these people use the exact same verbiage that we use for freedom of speech, but they use it to take out unpopular journalists who oppose their regime, or they use it to put dissenters in prison, people who are artists who try to raise awareness about something that's happening within their country or within their government. They put them in prison because that's going against the spirit of freedom of speech as they consider it. And as a result, they are able to use those limitations and able to use the vocabulary of using these laws in the social interest, when in reality what they're doing is trying to prevent dissent, trying to prevent any potential for change. There are excellent points on both sides. That's part of why this is such a difficult topic to cover, and I think in a lot of cases, why people reach back to something like the Constitution to try to come up with some older, more fundamental wisdom that allows them to not have to worry about the things that they're giving up for whichever side they might take. To me, the idea that someone can incite others to violence with their words intentionally and with full knowledge of what they're doing and get away with it is horrible. Likewise, the idea that someone could slander me and that slander would go completely unchallenged and unrestricted, that it's their right to say whatever they want, that's terrifying to me. That, that idea, I think, if you really think about it, that somebody, for any reason or no reason at all, could permanently scar you for life in that way is, is horrifying. Now, on the other hand, I don't like the idea that if I don't fall into socially acceptable lockstep, that I could be labeled a criminal. Having controls on what's okay in terms of speech is a recipe for abuse, and it's used liberally around the world, like I said, by authoritarians everywhere but also states that wouldn't consider themselves authoritarian and that most of us wouldn't consider authoritarian either. And yet they use these powers to squelch opposing viewpoints. I would strongly argue that this is part of the rationale behind the imprisoning and persecuting of whistleblowers within the United States. This has been used in almost every country in the world, and the United States is very much included in that group. And so this conflict between two kind of equally horrible <laughs> different ends of a spectrum is what is spurring on this confluence of articles and protests and movements at the moment. We see daily articles and think pieces and headlines that are definitely written to try to stimulate outrage about free speech zones on campuses and trigger warnings and the freedom of expression within public spaces, the freedom to publish whatever one pleases, or the consequences that people receive as a result of that. We see pieces on the freedom to carry guns, the freedom to contribute vast sums of money to politicians, or to block or to not block other people on the internet. There's a lot going on within this sphere under that larger umbrella of freedom of speech because there's a lot to say. 
And there's a lot of different ideas that are very difficult to make just one argument for that covers all circumstances and situations. So a few general things to keep in mind when thinking about and discussing this topic. First, remember that threats to the freedom of speech, whatever we happen to mean when we're talking about the freedom of speech, whatever end of the spectrum or space in between we're talking about, the, the threats are coming from all sides. It's not coming from just one party or another, just one government or another, just one religion or another, just one age demographic or economic group. It's everybody. Everybody is looking at this and trying to adjust it and align it with their own values and their own perception and their own view on what would be the best possible solution of bad solutions. The, the specific arguments and maneuvers and means of trying to achieve this are different in every single case, but in almost every case, it is a group of people trying to use that term as a cudgel against somebody else who's trying to use it in a different way. So it's a bunch of different groups with a bunch of different diverse interests, and all of them think that they're doing the right thing, and that's important to remember as well. All of them think that they have the constitution behind them, they think that they are on the side of righteousness, and that the people on the other side, or the people who are maybe even close to them on the spectrum but still think a little bit different, those people are trying to chip away at something that they consider to be very fundamental and good. And so when you look at the responses, you look at the arguments, and you look at a lot of the venom and vitriol that surrounds this, keep that in mind. I also want to note that the freedom of speech doesn't mean that you have the freedom to be listened to, believed, or taken seriously. This is something you see a lot in public spaces and on social networks like Twitter and Facebook. People will shout inanities and then get upset when other people decide to ignore or unfollow them or block them. Yeah, I mean, you often have the right to say whatever stupid or insulting thing comes into your head, but you don't have the right to someone else's attention. When that happens, it isn't censorship. It's people having free will. And then finally, it's important to note that there is a difference between private and public spaces when it comes to free speech. Shouting, I'll kill you all in your own home, is different from shouting the same thing in a crowded McDonald's. There are places where speech is completely free in the legal sense, and there are places, privately owned places, places with enhanced security, and so on, where it's not. Whether this should or shouldn't be the case is also debatable. But the distinction's important. All too often, people will misinterpret a very specific situation. Say, there's somebody singing dirty songs in the frozen food section at a local grocery store. And if the owner of that grocery store boots that guy out, that's not a violation of free speech. It's just the execution of company policy. He's just kicking somebody out of a private space, not a public space. And so don't conflate those two if you can avoid it. There's a lot of situations where we conflate free speech with something else. And it's important to remember and identify that distinction as often as possible. So the focus of this article is how free speech applies to college campuses. And it's basically showing a lot of the antagonism against what's happening within campuses, where a lot of younger people are applying the concept of free speech or viewing the concept of free speech in a different way than their parents' generation did. And so the, the older people, the, the parents' generation, are looking at this and feeling offended and feeling victimized because what they considered to be normal, what they considered to be acceptable and a growth experience, being, being exposed to different ideas, being exposed to what today in a lot of cases would be considered bigoted activities and norms, the idea of, of dressing in blackface for Halloween and, and making prejudiced or racist or misogynistic jokes. These are all things that were common but considered to be a growth opportunity because you were exposed to different ideas. You were exposed to new concepts and difficulties and challenges, and you were expected to be stronger when you came out the other side as a result. 
Now, the flip side of that is that younger people, uh, millennials as they're often called, which is a term that generally applies to people who were born between 1980 and the year 2000, these people are much more likely to think, and there's actually studies that show this, they're much more likely to think that it's okay to take away some freedom of speech, uh, particularly on college campuses, but in general, I think the studies said. If it prevents people from being racist, homophobic, misogynistic, etc., there's such a vast gulf between social norms in those two generations that it's easy to understand why they would conflict. But what we have here is them coming to a head in a situation where you can actually regulate that because the concept is that college campuses should be this crazy free speech zone where you say anything that you want and you're exposed to a lot of difficult ideas. But what's slowly but surely happening is that we're seeing more restriction on freedom of speech and more instances of things like free speech zones, where it's like one small portion of ground on the campus where you can go and say whatever you want, but everything else is regulated. And potentially that free speech zone you have to book in advance. And it's definitely easy to see why that would be considered a step backwards from a generation whose parents uh, were probably fighting in World War II and they were looking at the world in terms of freedom versus authoritarianism. And so the idea of absolute freedom, even if you're saying stupid shit, was really important. But the counter-argument to that, and the argument that a lot of younger people in particular are making, but again, not just young people, but in, in this case, we'll, we'll use that as the differentiating factor, college students and the people who support them, a lot of them are saying that the behavior that existed in college campuses before was actually very exclusionary. These things that were considered normal were in fact silencing certain groups. They were silencing women and racial minorities and the LGBT community and a lot of other groups that were outcasts or had to hide aspects of themselves in order to participate in that conversation. And so socially, they were being excluded. And so these limitations, these regulations, are in place to ensure that everybody has an equal standing. It's not meant to clamp down on everything. It's meant to level the playing field in the only way that they can think to do that. In other words, it it quashes some discussions. It will prevent you from wearing blackface for Halloween. It will prevent you from making lewd comments to the woman sitting next to you in class. But it will enable the black people at the school to feel comfortable going to the Halloween parties, and it will enable the woman sitting next to you in class to participate and not feel that she's going to be treated like a piece of meat. So the difficult question that we find ourselves addressing is whether intolerance of intolerance equals tolerance or intolerance. It's very difficult to figure out what that actually results in because you could argue that intolerance of intolerance is just another type of intolerance because it forces a certain group of people out of the conversation or at least forces them to have a different type of conversation than they would prefer to be having. But on the other hand, it enables so much that it forces a type of tolerance on a community. Not everybody maybe wants to have that type of tolerance, but it makes the commonly accepted conversation a little bit more accessible to a larger majority of the population. I think freedom of speech in general, not, not just on campuses, but everywhere, as a general rule within society, is an uncomfortable dichotomy. When you have an absolute freedom of speech, it creates a cesspool. It, it's kind of like a, a forest or a jungle. It's an incredibly wild biome. And it leads to a lot of evolution. It does lead to a lot of important discussions. And you never know how people and how ideas are going to mutate as a result. It's just that like a forest or a jungle or any other ecosphere, any other biosphere, it's also brutal. It's wild. It is primitive. It is something that will evolve, yes, but you're going to watch a lot of like baby kittens be killed by eagles as it happens. It's not something that is going to be equally beneficial. It's something that's going to be very violent and merciless. And we have to decide if that is worth the trade off, if the benefits are worth what we give up to get there. 
Now, having more limits on our freedom of speech provides more safety, more relative safety for more people, at least to those who color within the newly established guidelines. But it's also important to note, or at least think about, whether or not a freedom of speech situation in which you're told you are free to say whatever you want, except this, is actually freedom of speech. It might be a relatively open framework for dialogue, and it might be a set of rules and regulations that actually encourages more people to participate and allows more people to have full, rich, participatory lives. But can it truly be said to be free? Is it truly free speech in, in the way that we often use that phrase? It seems to me that we need to figure out a way to balance these seemingly unbalanced opposites. But I'm not sure I've seen a good model for that, like anywhere, anywhere I've been in the world. I don't know that I've seen the perfect balance of limiting freedom of speech and allowing people to say whatever the hell. I'm not sure I'd even know it if I saw it, frankly. I'd have no idea what it would look like. I'd have no idea what success would look like in terms of creating such a system. All I can imagine is that maybe it would be a set of limits, like we've got now at our universities and a lot of other institutions today. And like those limits, they would be inspired by the growth and evolution of the past. I mean, it is an evolution of where things were, where we are today. The idea that we have a more egalitarian, inclusive society. But then there would be a system built in somewhere that would allow us to continue to maneuver and adjust and rework and maybe even break and rebuild those rules in that system at some point, at regular intervals or irregular intervals along the way. It's the type of solution that I, I get the impression wouldn't make anybody terribly happy. And it's also one that I have little reason to think would actually work in real life. But, you know, I'll present it. I'll say it anyway. Because I can do that, for the time being at least. Let's Know Things is produced and hosted and written and researched and everything by me, Colin Wright. It's a relatively new project for me, and it's something that I'm really enjoying, but I'm still sorting out the details like how to support it long term. At the moment, I'm asking that if you enjoy it, if you enjoy this podcast, consider buying one of my books. I'm an author for a living, and this is something that I'm doing on the side right now. You can find those books at colin.io, uh, or if you prefer, if you don't read books, or if you've already read them all, or if you just feel like you're in a more directly giving mood, you can easily pay a dollar an episode, if you like, over at colin.io slash contribute. And I've got it set up so you can pay via cash, me, or PayPal, or Venmo really easily. So that's, that's another option. I've linked to both of those in the show notes. You can also show your support non-monetarily by rating the show on iTunes or wherever it is that you download your podcasts. Ratings and reviews help immensely, especially for a new show like this one. And sharing it with your friends also helps if you know of somebody that might enjoy this type of podcast. Either way, however you choose to support, if you choose to support, I really, truly appreciate it. That means a lot. I also want to mention that I have another side project at the moment called Consider This. It's a YouTube show, and if you enjoy this, you'll probably enjoy that as well. So I've linked to that in the show notes, too. If you haven't already, consider signing up for the Let's Know Things newsletter, which is a free weekly newsletter that contains an assortment of curated, interesting links. If you want to discuss those links, or share your own interesting links, or discuss this episode, or just say howdy, you can do so over at the LKT Facebook page which is located at facebook.com slash let's know things. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I will see you next week. Mm -hmm.